Hey guys, Ryan here, back with another video on functional programming. The other day I was reviewing a PR and I realized that not everyone who uses option understands the patterns uh, and the way to structure your code in order to get the most out of the option class. So what I'm going to do in this video is I'm going to assume that you already know what an option is and you already understand the motivations behind why you would want to use it. And you're still picking up some of the best practices around how to structure your code and, and how to use it the way that it's intended to be used. So in this example, uh, what I have is a little function that I've written in an imperative way called is.com, where basically we accept a URL and maybe the URL looks something like this, and all that I want to know is, is the top level domain a .com or, or not? And that's essentially it. Now, URLs can get pretty complex, and I don't want to do all of uh, this parsing, so I found this library on NPM called ParseURL, and I'm going to use that to do the heavy lifting. Um, so basically, this, this library, I mean, it's got over 3 million, 3 million installs, right? And it, it takes a URL and it parses it into different pieces. And essentially what I'm looking for is this resource key. And from the resource key, I can split the host name and, and see if I can get the top level domain. Now, if you kind of scroll down a little bit here, what you'll see is that the author left us this nice little note that says, this throw if invalid URLs are provided. So what I have here is a try catch that will, that will catch this situation. And if it's invalid and we can't find a top level domain, then all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just assume that it's not a .com, we can't get it, just return false. So then after I get the host name, uh, I split it into parts, and then of course I'm gonna check to make sure that we actually got something out of the split and that the array is not empty. And if so, then I grab the last part of it, which is the top level domain, and then have an if statement and check if it's com or if it's not. So fairly straightforward and actually I would say that this code looks reasonable to me. It's not bad. But there are a couple of things that I would point out here. Um, so one, we've got this huge try-catch wrapping basically all of our code. So n not ideal. Uh, so I'd like to try to get rid of this. And another thing is that we have these if statements here, which again, that, that seems fine, but man, it would be great if we could kind of at least streamline the way that, that all of this branching occurs um, and kind of simplify some of these conditionals, right? So what I'm gonna do to solve this problem is to take an alternative approach and I'm gonna use options to kind of clean it up a little bit. And for this example, I'm gonna be using FPTS. I've already done a video on um, kind of introducing FPTS and using the array module. And here we're gonna be using its option module now, options are a fairly general concept, right? So while I'm gonna be using FPTS, pretty much everything that I say here carries over to different libraries and even different languages. Um, the same practices hold true no matter which implementation you're using. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come up here and import pipe from FPTS function. And let's import everything as O from FPTS option and import everything as A from FPTS array. All right, so now we're ready to get started here. I'm gonna go down here, I'm gonna define a different function with the exact same um, signature, but it's gonna be called is.com and I'll just say opt for for option or optional. So this is gonna take a string, and I just noticed that this, this should be lowercase up here. Um, okay, now what are we gonna do? Well, first thing that I wanna take care of is this, this, this exception when we call parse URL. If we have an invalid URL, it throws an exception, so then we end up with a missing value. Um, so let's, let's go ahead and, and tackle that. And I'm gonna do this in a separate function. So let's call it try parsing URL. And yeah, that's fine. So it's gonna take a string. And now 
here is one of the first mistakes that I see people who have started using option, they've decided to use option, and this is one of the first mistakes they'll make. They say, okay, I'm gonna try parsing the URL, and it should return this parse URL type, or if the, if the URL is invalid and we can't get it, then I'll just return null. So this is the first mistake because if you've decided to use option, then there's really no reason for you to use null. Um, option replaces null. That's the idea is that option can represent either a value that's defined or the alternative case, which is that we don't have a value. We've got a missing value. And that's what null is supposed to represent. But of course, null isn't type safe and it's not pleasant to work with. So instead, I'll fix this. And what we're going to say is we're going to return an option of our parsed URL. Uh, and since this is a type in the option module, I have to prefix it with, with this um, o dot option. Just as a side note, if you're following along, this typed parse URL, I actually had to manually export it from this library because it wasn't, wasn't being exported properly. But now we have it, and we want to return an option. And this leads us to our second mistake that I see people make. So uh, let's say, okay, I need to open up a try catch statement and I'm gonna try running this parse URL function, which could throw and we'll catch it. If I've made it to this point within the try statement, if I've called parse URL and it hasn't thrown yet, then we know that we have a value. So what I'll say is return o.sum parsed. So parse is the value that we're interested in. O.sum is the function that takes this value and it wraps it into an option, right? And then if we don't have one and it failed, then we return O.none. Now, this is fine, it's not a big deal, but the thing is you almost never need to use these functions directly to construct an option. You, you shouldn't need o.sum and o.none in order to construct your option. There's almost always a better way. In most cases, um, that better way will be if you're dealing with null values, then you say option from nullable and then feed it the value that you're interested in. Uh, in this case, we're not dealing with a null value. We're dealing with an exception. So what I'll say is um, o.tryCatch, which is another function that does basically the same thing. But what this will allow us to do is to call our function, parse URL, and if you look at the documentation, it says transform an exception into an option. If f throws, return none. Otherwise, return the output wrapped in an option. So this is what we want. Uh, of course, we need to return the value. Okay. So there we go. We, we've taken this nasty exception and we've kind of isolated it into its own function. And before it's even had a chance to do anything, we've wrapped that into a try catch. Now we've got a nice option. This isn't gonna throw, it's handled. Uh, we're done there. So here I'm gonna say parsed URL opt is gonna be equal to try parsing URL. And if I hover over this to look at the type, I can see that what we have is the parse URL, that's the value we're interested in, and of course it's wrapped in an option. Now, what we wanna do is we wanna take this and we need to access the resource key on this parsed option. That's where the host name is stored and that, that's what I'm, I'm after here. Now, this leads me to the third mistake and probably the biggest mistake that I see people making all the time is they say, hmm, okay, I've got this parsed URL and I need the resource inside of it, but it's wrapped in an option. So maybe if I can get the parsed URL out of the option, then I can access the resource. So what you'll see them do is something that looks like this. Let's get our resource. We'll take our option and we'll say, okay, maybe dot get, uh, dot get, I wanna get the value and then I'm gonna call a resource on it um, maybe, so it looks like that doesn't work here. And actually in, in a lot of libraries, this, this will work. In other words, git is defined and it will allow you to just directly extract out 
the value from our option. But the problem with doing this is that for parse URL opt, this option, we don't know right now if it's defined or if it's not, right? At this point in the code base, we have no idea. So if you call dot get to try to extract the value out of the option, what's going to happen if there's no value to extract? What's going to happen if this is not? Uh, the answer to that is that it depends on the library that you're using. But most of the time, it means you'll, you'll get an error. You'll throw an exception. So then, and then what you'll see people do is they say, OK, what I need to do actually is I only try to get the value out if it's defined, right? That makes sense. This is what I've been taught since I started learning programming is let's say, OK, O is, is defined is sum. And I will put my, my option in there. OK, if it's defined, then what I want to do is to take this option and then somehow get, get the value out of it. And then if it's not, then you know we return none or we do something else. Now again, the problem here is that, OK, even though at this point we know that the option is defined, this is still a bit of an anti-pattern when you're using options, right? Like we still, we're having to open up this if statement, this conditional. And this is actually the, like this is one of the main benefits of using option in the first place is that it should be able to handle these exceptional cases for us. If you find yourself trying to directly extract out the value from an option, or if you find yourself opening up if statements to try to figure out whether an option is defined or not, you're probably missing the point. There's almost always a better way to go about this. So in this case, what I want to do, instead of just getting, getting the value and trying to extract the resource, is I'm going to say, OK, my resource option is going to be equal to o.map. And map is going to give me my parsed URL, and it will let me extract off the resource field. And I need to feed this my option, parsed URL opt. So if we take a look at what this returns, what you'll see is that it's returned to us a string. So that's, that's the resource that we're looking for. But that string is wrapped inside the option. So essentially, we started with an option here. And we ended up with an option. Now we have an option of, of something different. Instead of a parsed URL object, we're going to have an option of a string. And that's what we want. So we've carried this option through the calculation. And notice that we didn't need to use an if statement to do that, or we didn't need to use a dot get function. Essentially, we used the map function so that option could give us the value if it's defined, and then we can just do whatever we want with it. So what's next? We just got the resource. Now we need to split it into parts. So I think for this, I'm going to uh, I'm going to put this in a different function. I'm going to call it get TLD for top level domain. And what this is going to do is it's going to take our resource. And since I need to split this string and I don't know what's going to be inside of it, maybe I get an empty array out of this. Um, again, rather than return null, what I'm going to do is I'm going to return option of string. Hopefully, this string will be the top level domain. If it's not, then we just return none. So in order for me to do this, I'm going to split this. OK. And at this point, what is parts? Parts should be, it's an array of strings. But I need to test to make sure that that array is not empty before I try to grab a string out of it. Um, so I could open up an if statement. But actually, there is a better way of doing this. So if you look at the documentation for FBTS, here. So I just open up the documentation. And I found this, this method called last. And it says, get the last element in an array, or none if the array is empty. Uh, excellent. So this is, this is exactly what I want to do. The top level domain in this host name should be the last element. And if there's nothing in this array, then I'll just return none. And I can let FPTS handle this for me. So I'll just feed it parts. So this will return option of a string. Now, since we're, we're using FPTS, I'm going to go ahead and uh, make this pipeable. So I'm going to open up a pipe. I'm going to feed in the thing that we care about, resource. And then I'm going to take that, and I'm going to operate on it. So I'll split it. 
So this will give me an array. And then on that array, I want to call a.last. So this should be the exact same thing, except that as soon as I saved, Prettier reformatted this for me. And I actually, I don't like this format as much. I prefer the multi-line format, but, uh, but that's okay. We'll leave it for now. Okay, so, so now we have our resource option down here with a string. And I need to somehow call this function, get TLD, but it doesn't take an option. And actually I did that very intentionally. I don't, this function doesn't care whether or not the resource exists. It needs to do its job. It only can do its job if it has a resource that's already defined. So there's no point in accepting an option. So it just accepts the resource if it's defined. And it's going to rely on the caller to handle the situation where resource isn't defined. Now the way that we do that as the caller is again, not to open up an if statement and test, but instead I will say o.map and I'm gonna take my resource, which is a string. And on this, I will call get TLD. And I need to feed in the option. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and save this as TLD opt. And there's a few things going on here, so let's, let's kind of break it down. First off, if I inspect the type for what this returns, what I see here is not an option of my TLD string, which is what I was hoping for. It's actually an option of an option of a string. So we actually have a situation where we've got options nested inside of options, and that's not exactly a situation that we want to be in. So uh, why is this happening? Well, if you look at the line above it, we had this option, and we called dot map, and it returned, and the function that we fed the map returned a string. And so it just took the thing that was inside of the option and swapped it out with the new thing. But now we're calling a function that doesn't just return a string. It doesn't just return a value. It actually returns an option of a value. So we've got ourselves in a situation where the original option that we had, it took the thing inside of it and mapped it into an option of a string. And so now we've got layers of options. Fortunately, this is uh, something that comes up so often that um, FPTS has, has dealt with this for us, and there's actually a function that's very similar to map, but goes by a different name. It's called chain. And this will do the exact same thing. It maps our value, and if we end up in a situation where we have multiple options, then it flattens those into a single option, so that now if we, if we inspect what we're, we have, it's just a single option of a string. So the way that I like to think about this, just to kind of simplify it a little bit, is if you're in a situation where you have an option and you need to call a function that's just going to return just another value, then you use map, just like we did here. If you have an option and you need to call a function that's going to return another option, then you call dot chain so that it'll flatten it. Now, in other languages and other libraries, a lot of times this method will go by a different name. Um, I'm used to seeing it as flat map in Scala. And I, honestly, I kind of prefer the name flat map, but whatever, it doesn't matter. It, it works all the same. So now we have our top level domain. All that's left to do really is to test this and see if it's equal to com. So basically what I wanna do is I wanna turn this into a Boolean value. Instead of the string, I need a Boolean, and that's what I'm ultimately after. So again, what I'm going to say is is.com option equals map, because I need to call a function that's just going to return a Boolean value. So map should work here. I'm going to take my top level domain, which is a string, and I'm going to compare it to com. And I almost forgot, I need to feed my option here. And if I, expect, if I inspect this, then uh, I have an option Boolean. Okay, we have the value that we want, right? Ultimately, 
our function is.com is just supposed to return a Boolean value. But we're uh, here where it's actually wrapped in an option. So we have taken this option as far as it can go, and we're finally at the point where, okay, I need this value. I need to extract the value. Um, again, we don't want to use an if statement. We don't want to use .get. There's actually a safe way of doing this, and it's called get or else. So I'll say is.com is equal to get or else. And if this is undefined at this point, then I'm just going to return false, and I'm going to feed it the option. So this function is taking our option. If it's defined, then it will return the thing that's inside of it. If it's not, then we're just going to default to false. And now we should have what we're ultimately after, which is just a Boolean value. So let's go ahead and return that. And we're good, right? So since we are in FPTS, what I'm going to do is just very quickly um, pipe all of this together. So we start with the thing that we're interested in, the URL, and then I need to map this. Uh, no, first I need to call try parsing URL, and then I need to map it. And then I need to get the top level domain of the resource. So I will call take the resource, call get TLD on this resource. Now, since this anonymous function isn't really doing anything here, um, we can just remove this and just feed our, our function directly. And then once I have the top level domain, I need to test to see if it's a .com. Okay, and then after that's done, then I can get the value or else I return a default. And this should give us what we're looking for. All right, there's a lot going on here, so let, let's, let's break it down. Um, one thing real quick, just for bonus points here, uh, this operation that we're doing at the very end where we we map our string into a Boolean value and then get the Boolean value or return a default if it's undefined. This is actually uh, something that comes up quite often and there's another function that does the exact same thing and it's called exist. So let's use that instead. But, but basically all this is saying is, okay, if the option exists and it satisfies this predicate, then we're going to um, return true. If it doesn't exist or if it doesn't satisfy the predicate, then we're going to return false. Okay, so we've come a long way. A lot, a lot has happened here. Uh, let's kind of take a look at this from the, the bird's eye view. So first thing that I want to point out is if you take a look at the signature that we started with and the signature that we ended with, these are exact, exactly the same. So ultimately what that means is that the fact that we're using option to solve this problem is just an implementation detail in, in, this, in this demo. The second thing that I want to point out is in this example, you can see that what, we, what we've done is we've kind of we've gotten an option and then we carried that all the way through our computation. Um, so here, try parsing URL, that's where we, we got the option and then we kept the option and we kept the option Finally, we got rid of the option and we can return a Boolean. This is, this is important because it's, in a, it's like the pattern that you're trying to get to when you're using option is that you want to take all of your computations and kind of streamline them, carry the option all the way through the computation as far as you can go until you absolutely can't go any further. And then, then you can get rid of it. Use get or else, use exist or something similar. But I see people all the time where they start with an option and then they want to convert it and then there's some if statements and then they convert it back to an option and uh, that's not really what you're after. There's a third thing to notice here, which I actually, I think this is the most important piece, which is that if you take a look at this original code, right, there was a lot of branching here. There's a lot of conditionals. First, we started out with this try catch and then we've got some if statements that are nested together. 
And if you take a look at what we ended up with, there's actually no branching. You can't find a single conditional statement here, which is kind of crazy. How did we go from something that had all of these branches, all of these exceptional cases just kind of piled in to something where there's not a single if statement, there's not a single ternary operator, there's not a single conditional. And I think it's actually reasonable to kind of ask yourself, how, how did we even end up here? How is this even possible? I mean, you know, when you're taught programming, I think most people learn that if statements and conditions are a natural and necessary part of programming. And yet here we've managed to get ourselves into a situation where we, we don't have any at all, which is, uh, which is kind of interesting. The way that we were able to do this is by using option. And the option class is essentially what abstracted away all of the complexity of the conditionals and dealing with all the exceptional cases out of the way. And what this allows us to do is to focus on writing our code in a way that expresses the happy path. Like, it, let's pretend like nothing bad is going to happen. I'm going to parse the URL. I'm going to get the resource. I'm going to get the top level domain, see if it's a .com, and then I'm done. Of course, there's a bunch of places all throughout this code, throughout the helper functions, where this could go wrong. But option has taken care of that for us. Now, I think no matter what you kind of, what, whatever your opinion is on what this code looks like and the syntax versus what this code looks like on the syntax, this is a pretty powerful idea that we can solve the same problem, but with a very different pattern where we just focus on the happy path and all of the exceptional cases are effectively handled for us by option. It turns out that option is just one of a much larger class of abstractions that all have similar properties. But I'm gonna save all that for another video, so make sure you subscribe, stay tuned, I'll see you guys next time.